Okay, I'm going to go through this uh, pretty quickly because I love talking about this stuff, so I put in way too many slides, so I'm going to have to go fast. I apologize. Um, so today in the U.S., there's about a billion used cell phones sitting in our collective drawers and closets, and that's just cell phones. There's lots of other stuff, an average of about six per household. Annually, we add another 150 million to that pile, and at their value, their value at the point when they are retired is about seven billion dollars. It goes into the drawer, it decays into nothing, and we throw it in the landfills generally. And we do this while there's a huge secondary market uh, for these devices, um, almost five billion dollars last year. Um, how do you stop that cycle? Capture those things while they have value, and put them in the hands of people that need them, want them. Um, and so that's what we set out to do, um, and spent the last couple of years building uh, the Eco ATM, which automatically inspects prices, connects you with the secondary market, and pays the consumer on the spot. Um, the features and benefits, uh, the step one is, and I'll show a video in a second, uh, we visually ID the device and inspect it. We electrically inspect it. We connect it to the secondary market live, and uh, the best price we can find, we present that. And we offer to remove the data because we're connected to the device. And then we pay uh, either in cash or in store credit, depending on the location. Consumer benefits, obviously, they turn trash into cash, discounts on new purchases. Um, they, it's eco-responsible, and then we take care of the personal data. Retailers benefit because the buyback dollars are generally spent in the store. It increases customer foot traffic and return foot traffic, and it puts them in compliance with a mushrooming set of e-waste laws. Um, let me talk about the environmental piece of it for a second. Um, throwing a phone is in the landfill is, is bad. It's not nearly like a leaded monitor or a PC, but it's pretty nasty stuff, and they add up. Um, the creation of a new phone is actually the worst part of it. Um, in the creation of a new phone, just the tiny bit of uh, precious metals that are in a single phone generates about three tons of toxic mining waste just to get to that little smidgen of gold. So if we can stop that cycle um, and put a, a phone that was already built back into use in a second life or a third life, you've stopped that for at least one cycle. And if you can harvest that used device, if it no longer, if it's end of life, and get those metals back, you stop that. So I think that's the bigger half of it. Um, there's an expanding set of e-waste laws, and we put retailers in compliance with that. And better yet, we bring visibility and I think accountability follows that by connecting with every device we've ever collected and will collect. We get the serial number, the make model, and connect that with the consumer data and where it was collected. And so as everything is tracked downstream, um, if it shows up in a wok in China or in a smelting barrel in Ghana, uh, we can track that all the way back and figure out where it went wrong. Um, so retailers are eager to get this, to stop the pain that they're feeling from these e-waste laws that are, that are uh, coming down. So let me give you a scale of the e-waste problem. So one boxcar holds about 75,000 phones. 150 million phones in the U.S. annually, that's about 2,000 boxcars. That's about a 20-mile train. That's a train from here to Oceanside, full of phones that comes in every year. And uh, just a few boxcars come out and enter the recycling chain. That's phones alone. Think about PCs, cameras. I haven't done the math on that, but that's a lot of more boxcars of stuff. So it adds up your little bit with everybody else's. Um, now remember the three tons of toxic mining waste per phone. Imagine what it is for all this other stuff. So those piles of Toxic mining waste are sitting out of sight from us, but they're generated every time we buy one of these things. Um, so our key technology and patents to get to this, to make it convenient for consumers, incentivize them to participate in the process, um, and take care of their data. We have a visual ID um, inspection um, system that uses cameras and algorithms. It also uh, looks at damage and can assess the damage. And then we also have technology that erases the phones. So let me run a short video here um, with cool music. Show you quickly how it works. Feel free to dance if you want.
So this is still in prototype stage, but it works and we're, we're improving it every day. Um, we have nine kiosks uh, in the field, 50 months of field data over the last seven months. Um, if you have phones, they're at the local Westfields uh, around town. Um, and crowds are a regular feature. Um, it works, the mousetrap catches mice. Um, we've collected 30,000 plus phones from 12,000 customers in about seven months, a half a million revenue. Um, and on the satisfaction side, customers love it. And uh, we even have a fair bit of repeat customers already. Um, let me give you an analog to uh, can and bottle recycling. A lot of you probably aren't old enough to remember the crying Indian and the, when I grew up, people just threw trash out of the window and it was uh, all the ditches and uh, side of the road was trash. Um, the bottle bill of 1971 incentivized uh, taking back, you know, the, the redemption value. And within, I used to get up in the morning and if I wanted something from the store, I could get enough money just walking two blocks um, to buy uh, whatever I wanted by collecting bottles. A couple of years later, you couldn't do that. Incentivized uh, redemption laws cleaned that up and then the, uh, the recycling rates, rates went through the roof and then it became automated. We want to reverse this and, uh, and, and make it happen much faster. Uh, the tipping point now uh, is not dirty roadsides, but it's our, our cabinets and closets and drawers are full of this junk. Um, there's a lot of laws coming down that are, that are going to force this, um, but uh, we'd like to reverse this, put automation up front, incentivize people without the laws having to do it, and make it easy and convenient so that people participate and compress that from 40 years of, uh, into five. So how do you take, uh, let me shift gears here. How do, we were in Starbucks, two guys in a laptop a couple of years ago, and how do we go from that to where we're at today? Um, I think one of the biggest opportunities to create something from nothing um, and uh, is in the area of uh, aligning um, the profit motive with uh, the environmental motive. You can do well and you can do good at the same time. And, and you can do that by finding a way for your customers to do well and do good at the same time. And how you do that in the face of tough competition. Again, align the environmental motive and the profit motive. I think that's a green field that uh, we often, too often see those in conflict. Um, and I think the environmentalism has, uh, it's been sold at the wrong level too often. Um, everybody remembers Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think it needs to be taken down to the very basic level and align the uh, profit motive with um, doing well and doing good at, at the basic level. For all the people on the planet that aren't in the self-actualization part of it, bring it down to a level where they can participate. And I think that's the greenfield area. Um, so that intersection is not some impossible um, mirage that, that can't happen. I think it's actually not even a direct uh, crossroads. I think it can be a merger. And I think that's where the opportunity lies. So how do you make innovation happen? Um, how do you encourage it in yourself? And uh, can you make it happen at will? Um, we saw the Thomas Edison earlier. There was a, a recent Time magazine uh, covering him. It, it was great. And if you haven't seen it, I would look it up. Uh, the guy was amazing. He invented three industries, not just electrical power, but recorded music and motion pictures. And it was just an amazing run. And what he knew, here's some quotes from him. What he knew is that it really was hard work. Um, there's great ideas and you have to, but you have to work to find them. It's not just a divine inspired epiphany iPod. Um, you actually have to work um, and, and dig for this stuff, but it's just below the surface. Um, and I think his favorite, my favorite quote from him is that, uh, it's the last one here. He knew that if he sat and worked on it, did hard work, that he could create a minor invention in every 10 days. And he did this, and a huge one every six months. And they did that. And so I think that's um, a lesson for all of us. Right below the surface, um, where most people give up, there's just huge opportunities. And I think it's in this intersection of doing well and doing good, and allowing your customers to do so. 
Thanks.